two questions that I'll start off with that are just sort of general and I'm just popped into my mind. What would you say is the question that's most asked of you, Mike? And what is um, like the most irritating question that you've been asked where you're just like, I can't follow well, if you ask me that? The, mo yeah. <laughs> the most irritating question is about the name is either like, what does the name mean? Or probably even more irritating than that is why did you change the name from the Lord Weird Slough Fig to Slough Fig? Yep. That's like, I just don't. I, <laughs> that's the worst question. And whether that's the most common one, either that or like pe just people who ask questions that they don't remember or they don't know or they don't, they've never listened to us before and then realize like they've been doing this 20 something years and this is their ninth album. Well, like, what are your influences, you know, and stuff. I'm like, I don't want to, what the fuck? Like, how many times have I asked, answered that, you know? But when you are when you don't make it really big or anything, it's, it's one of those things that comes up. Because well, they never heard of the band. They think, oh, this is a brand new band, so, you know. That's really a weird uh, assumption to just sort of come down on. Like, if I'm hearing them for the first time, they must be new. That's well, a, so I don't know if that's it, but either that or someone's just not thinking very much. Just two interviews ago, someone asked me that. What are your influences? What does the band name mean? And it's like, fuck. <laughs> this could be talk for about any it. band. <laughs> I know, you know, exactly. Yeah, you know, interchangeable exactly. questions are a real pain in the dick. I've, I've never been a big fan of them. But, um, all right, so yeah, we're going to we're gonna get to some sort of stock stuff. Hopefully not too much. Yeah, hopefully yeah, just yeah. You know, stuff that it's generally about the album. And hopefully maybe a couple things that, you know, going to take us into directions that we weren't expecting. So that's what, okay. I, that's what I like to do. Um, and my name is Matt Longo, by the way. Thank you, Mike, right, for, got it. Yeah. Okay. for joining us today for the Last Rights podcast. I appreciate it. So, well, number one. <laughs> let's talk about a little bit about just the essence, the notion of digital resistance. Um, what do you think are the, the pros and cons of that? Because, you know, you can be a self proclaimed of what technology. Mean? Well, in, in just the sense of like, all right, so here's, here we are. We would probably not be able to conduct this interview as easily were it not for Skype and digital technology. And I'm channeling this through a computer and blah, blah, yeah. blah, blah, blah. blah. Um, it, it, the whole, That's exactly my point. Yeah. Is that it's too easy? Is that the the point? Is that I wouldn't I wouldn't have to do this fucking bullshit if it weren't for goddamn tech. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's, it's, it's clearly a double edged sword. It's like you know, it's it's no, like, no, it's the, not true. The, the, the technology is a product of its times, and we you know march ceaselessly forward. But is it? Uh, how well let's just say this at first how has slough egg changed as a band um considering your 20-year existence considering the, the, the how much the, uh, technology has exploded in the last couple of years in terms well, of digital distribution in terms of connectivity I, I don't really like this. know like i can't really know the answer to that because how much has it changed because of technology well probably more than i'll ever be able to realize but then that gets into the whole that gets into some, to some pretty complex reasons, you know, like like w the whole world has changed, and that's influenced us changing. Of course, I mean, that, of course, we've changed with the world in ways. I mean, the image that you have or that somebody has of Slaufeg, like uh, the fact that people are even aware of Slaufeg, or the way they become aware of Slaufeg, that of course it, you know, makes a difference in how they how they uh, perceive it. Mm -hmm. All these things have been, I'm sure, have been completely uh, altered by technology. But I, I don't even know about how that, you know, I mean, I can't even tell what the influence of technology on a lot of that stuff is. But on the actual band internally, yeah, it hasn't changed it that much. Other than, well, okay, I can't say that. Like we found two of the members of Slaufeg now were, were procured, were ascertained through... But one of them, Harry, through the drummer, through MySpace, right on, and Adrian, the bass player, like ten years ago, or more, more than that, through uh, um, you know Craigslist or something. So, right there. But then again, we may have they may have been you don't can't really tell because they may have been checking out if it was twenty years before that they may have been checking out ads in magazines or or record stores or whatever for for drummer needed or something. Yeah, or bass not, player. Nec you know, not, not necessarily so better or worse, but that's what's prolific yeah, in this day and age. So. It's really hard to say. Um, as far as our minor marginal success, if you want to call it that, and um, you know, getting on labels and touring and all that, that may have been facilitated by the internet. Although the first tours and the first things we did 
or not. They were through a tape trading sort of network, mm-hmm. pen pal stuff in the in the mid nineties. You know, so in the mid to late nineties. I I don't know. Um, You're still an analog kid. Well, I mean, I just wanted to use a rush reference. You know, no, I know. Yeah, we don't <laughs> we don't we don't record. We record on tape still for like the basic tracks, and then the other stuff gets done digitally, like vocals and guitar solos. But that's up to the engineer. I can't really. You know, I mean, that's a matter of money at this point. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's cheaper to do it that way. But so, as far as my life goes, it's a different thing. I mean, that's, you know, living in a technological world and seeing uh, some of the things that it does, <clears throat> some of which are kind of fun, some of which are kind of isolating. I don't know. It, if I want to go do something now, oh, yeah, well, I can't just go to where I think people might be or whatever um, or just, you know, leave the house and be like, Someone will call you and make plans. You know about this thing that people always <laughs> complain about. You have to be like, call me when you get there. Call me when you get halfway there. Call me when you get the whole way. It's, it's so many so many reasons that someone can flake on you or get confused or whatever. It's just such a pain in the ass rather than just meet me here at this time. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But it makes things more complicated and, and, and stupid. You know, it seems like you should just go meet somebody somewhere or go do whatever you got to do with all this crap getting in the way. It, it, it might have be contributing to this whole lack of, of indecision uh, or lack yeah, of, or lack, lack of decision. decision. Oh yeah. It, it becomes indecision. Cause, cause there's just this, it's this verbal and digital vomit. That's just kind of coming out all the time as opposed to being yeah. selective about what you want. The very fact that we can get it out there, the, the uh, necessity and the value of being first, in fact, what our news media has been doing daily, or at least the uh, shittier ones like Fox um, where or CNN, where it's just reflexive. Everyone wants to be first, but nobody wants to be right. You know, it's like... Oh, it's totally contributing to that because Twitter and stuff like that, it's like you got to, you know, you got to be the first one there to notice that blah, blah, blah. And then the news media is going to just say, blurt out whatever you know, sensationalistic thing they can get, of course, and you get all these people getting, fu- it f- makes things really weird mm-hmm. because people are tweeting every time someone, like around here, people are dying from the flu right now. There's a really awful flu going around. It's like killing oh, people. I and, that shit. But it's not even as bad as, well, it's just, it, it's a lot of this like, like instant uh, media bullshit where people are hearing things about oh, these little snippets, like these people die. That's making people paranoid. And obviously, some of it's just the traditional media thing of, of you know, uh, someone has the incentive to, 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 to make a dramatic story. Yeah. And, 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 and I'm sure there are incredibly like, contributive. And I'm sure there are killer flus out there. I mean, we've all seen. No, there are. But we, it's, it's getting. Outbreak. But, but like, you know, swine flu and avian flu, like when those were. Yeah, everyone went like, you know, batshit crazy about those. I mean, hell, my, my wife, who was then girlfriend, got swine flu at the time right when she moved in with me. And um, I miraculously did not get it. But, I mean, she was laid out, but in no yeah. danger of dying. So I think that's yeah. just what it was for most people. Like, you know, well, if you it, weren't it, an it, infant it getting... or an elderly person, you're going to live. It's just going to be a pretty inconvenient flu for a little while. Yeah. Well, it's getting it's, – you're right. You know, people were starting to say because the, the news media travels so fast now and then yeah. it sort of exponentially grows or it snowballs that way because people will start to perceive that, oh, someone else is going to get this first. So I've got to be the one who says everybody's dying, you know, and then everybody gets paranoid and then it's a – oh, man. So I don't know. It's a, it's, it's a bit of a mess. I thought of some other example that I forgot in the midst of that, but it doesn't matter. Oh, I know what I was going to say. I was setting up some – you know, I was talking to – my booking agent about my U.S. booking agent about, or, or maybe less than a year ago, uh, doing shows in the, on the West Coast, and and there was another booking agent involved, and we got we were sort of back and forth a lot, the three of us text messaging, and the thing got all screwed up completely. It ended up they both ended up booking shows, you know, uh, uh, separate shows at separate venues in the same towns and mm-hmm. stuff, because. It was because of text messaging because we weren't on the phone with each other going, okay, what's – it was like, oh, I misconstrued this message. And you don't know exactly <laughs> the, the, some of the distinctions that you're trying to make. But- so it's like – well, that just seems kind of retarded right there because it's like – and literally retarded because you you, you could uh, not impede your understanding if you could just you know take two minutes or five minutes to have a conference call, I would imagine. Exactly, exactly. A little, little three-way Or just action. talk on the phone. Or, yeah. <laughs> or just, just, just talk and just be like, I don't even know how to do a conference call. Just be like, okay, this is going to happen. That's going to happen. But things can be taken. Uh, tone is one big deal when it comes to people's emotional reactions to mm-hmm. you a lot, you know, because you think someone's pissed at you or this or that. 
when they're not, or maybe they're being sarcastic, or you're not aware of that. But uh, if they are or not, but on, uh, with text messages, it was just a matter with this situation. It was a matter of logistics, mm-hmm. and it was a matter of not knowing what someone meant. You know, there's there's ambiguous statements you can make, and if you just get a little simple text like that, I get text texts all the time from people. There's one simple text, and they're open ended. I don't know which exact. I need to clarify, and you can't do the text. It's not easy to click because you go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You don't get to it. Whereas the friends say, wait, 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 wait. What I mean is, no, I'm asking you. Da da da. You know, and you can. Yeah, so it's it's really uh, I don't know whether texts uh, facilitate more communication or or in the final analysis less communication. Uh, I don't know. It's more communication, but less qualitative. There's I mean, just a lot of garbage about out there because because like really I like when I'm at work I you know I can't have my phone. I work, I work at a at a FedEx office. Ken goes and I'm, I'm yeah, yeah. when I'm managing the floor I can't be talking on my personal phone, so I keep it up yeah. back. And I try not to take phone calls, but what you can yeah. do, and what I often do, it's um, yeah, it's like it's like if I can shoot back every like half hour, or an hour. You know, I'm not like married to the thing, but it's convenient yeah. when you want to send it is yeah, as complete as you possibly can, which is, is something I strive for, and and uh, you know, in a in a quick message. And that's another thing too that pisses me off. Just as a quick side note, I don't know how anal you are about like punctuation, and because we're talking oh, about tone no, and whatnot. No. But dude, like I, 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 what do you say, real quick? Actually, would you say you're more for punctuation for clarity purposes, or are you kind of bad with it? Well, I, Asking you directly, I, right I'm now. for it, but whether I'm, I usually, I try to usually do it uh, when it's when it's a matter of clarity as much as possible. Yeah. Um, what I just get frustrated with is when um, it, you know it's a matter of, of clarity, or at least you should if you're an intelligent human being. And um, it, it, it really doesn't matter with me if it's like a text message or email or what have you. But I'm, I always – it's like punctuate as best you can because it's going to yeah. eventually save you time, you know? Oh, yeah, of course. In no, the yeah. long run. Yeah. Like I notice myself doing one thing that's not – uh, uh, well, no, this probably doesn't matter. Yeah, What's when that? saying meet me at two thirty, I don't, I don't do two colon thirty. I'll do two dot thirty. But I think everybody's going to get that. That's not the worst thing but, in the whole yeah, wide world. No, no. <laughs> but I mean, even when it comes to like it's, you know, it's is the big problem for anybody who's ever taught students or anything like that. Yeah. It's always it. But then again, that's also usually not misconstrued. But I don't, I know what you're saying. Oh yeah, yeah. and it could be a real bitch, you know. So. But anyway, anyway. Let's, uh, <laughs> this is good. This is good for me. I mean, it's good for me. <laughs> I got some more. Um, like, let's see. I wonder how I'm going to jump around here. I some got some music related questions. Some music related questions. It's, it's going to be more uh, thematically tied in, I think, because one of the things yeah. that I do like about um, about Slaufag albums is that even though they each one sounds quintessentially like Slaufag for a number of reasons, but lar- yeah. largely the vocals coupled with the guitars, <laughs> if anything else, but uh, every album is still imbued with its own character and that's one of the i think the things that makes you consistent one of the things that makes you a go-to uh band over the years because i mean shit dude I, there's been a lot of classic bands out there that they start really strong and you know you're gonna have some floundering albums and yeah. i i think there is just albums full of gems nine times deep now with oh wow play. that's great and, yeah because i oh, go ahead, go ahead. I, and, and well generally speaking i uh We'll talk a little bit more about digital um, resistance, but uh, one of the things I wanted to speak of, because we're talking about just the notion of digital resistance uh, in, you know, actual life and whatnot, and in Ape Uprising, for example, one of the themes was like mental evolution, right? Yeah. yeah. So I was wondering how you view human mental evolution and like maybe why we're embracing now so much technology and and the the convenience of it all are well, you, i think do, do you think we're just like lazy by nature or something well or, no, or, or enjoy convenience any, i don't think we're really anything by nature i think it's all adaptability well yeah i mean i think that you know looking at the human race as a process rather than a product or something you know okay meaning okay. meaning look at it looking at it uh, uh yeah process rather than product meaning if you actually believe in darwinian evolution uh as opposed to creationism not that I mean, yeah, if you believe in Darwin, Darwinian evolution that it ended that it was not started by an intelligent designer, mm-hmm. then uh, everything then there really is no set human nature. You know, there's just a, a, a bunch of potentials and or not potentials, but a bunch of uh, there's a bunch of changing conditions, and then we we survive. If we survive, it's by it's by some sort of uh, you know everything about us is the result of some sort of necessity. If you believe that, right, on that premise that, mm-hmm. that Darwinian evolution is actually true and it doesn't wasn't started by an intelligent designer, then um, 
it would follow naturally that everything about us w is the way it is because it had to be at some point for survival purposes. And uh, having said that, I completely forget why I said it or what the question was. No, uh, sorry, <laughs> it was digital. Uh, therefore, um, uh, what the hell is the point? Oh, you were asking me about why we, why we. Oh, yeah, okay. Because we we tend to get very uh, at this point, you know, we're 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 pretty lazy and and um, we don't have to really struggle as much as we as we used to. So. Um, the mental evolution there hasn't been much uh, uh progress in, but but you know uh, in recent years and and I, I think that my perspective on this is kind of messed up though because i have a really weird uh i mean maybe a lot of people are like this but i tend to think that like when i was a teenager i think this is just a, a human tendency but I, I used to think that things were going somewhere uh in the world as far as um uh, young people that i knew mm -hmm. Uh, being interested in like ideas and new ideas that there was a vibe of like you know some sort of progress like things were getting sort of through even in the media things were getting sort of hipper and start, people were starting to get more self-aware and stuff and mm -hmm. I felt like around the, the early 90s this just like stopped and then uh, uh, we started to regress now this could be chalked up to you know you just got older and jaded, or, or not jaded, you got more, you know, cynical, and you didn't see anything as new because you felt you'd seen it all. Or there's a tendency for humans to people to get older uh, and start to see that they're not immortal and stuff, and then they they sort of tend to think the world's aging or even the world's dying with them. You know, like old, you know, you're in your middle age, middle middle aged, and. Oh yeah, no, everything we've done it all before. The kids these days don't know anything new. You know, that's that's not a, yeah. a good attitude to take because you can sort of you can look at patterns in in generations before you and see that that's a a common thing, and it wouldn't make any sense. And you know, oh no, 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 the world's really screwed up right now. You know, in my parents' generation, they said it was screwed up like in the '60s, but now it's really no, they're, they're, we're really doomed now. That's not that's not a realistic attitude to take. But but I did feel that there is something. There's it's not just a generational. Uh, phenomena. There actually is something degenerative about the human race, at least as it uh, as it can be seen through the media, as it can be seen through uh, West American and Western culture. Mm -hmm. I feel like around 1984 or five, everything in you know music and movies and you know every, uh, TV, everything just kind of like you know uh, pop culture, pop humor, fashion, everything just stopped, and we've just been spinning our wheels. Uh, since that point i mean the one thing that's undeniable is if you look at like fashion trends and stuff like that not mm. you know, i'm not a big fashion guy but fa but like how you know, young people and their their sort of rock and and pop influenced way that they dress the with their haircuts and all that when's the last time you saw a new haircut that wasn't actually a, a a version of some older you know cool haircut from the 50s 60s 70s or 80s i mean nothing there's nothing new, you know what I mean? Since the '90s, like it's been all recycling. The, just in more, it's just been recycling since about 1980. Yeah. yeah, since the mid to late '80s, and that I think everything's been recycling. Music as well. Yeah. I think there was new, exciting music in the early '80s that hadn't been done before. But the late '80s on to the '90s, what what is there that is actually new that is not a recycle? Or at you least, know. at least stuff that was above ground at the time, because you because you can always look to an underground and and find you know yeah, uh, but not, diamonds but in the nineties there was underground music that was very similar to underground music in the eighties though. And but uh, I mean, what, what's the the tipping point you think? And um, you said it was eighty four, but like well, eighty five, maybe eighty five, eighty six, somewhere in there. But like that, there wasn't uh, like much above ground of quality that you think was coming out even in the in the late because like, I, mean, I don't know i'm just thinking of like things that are jumping to mind um like one of the first bands that i latched on to uh when i was very young that was a that was a new band that i loved was faith no more okay. i was i was like i don't know 10 or something yeah. uh, 10 or 11 and it just seemed really new and different and it was like 89 right. 90 at the time um and still they, you know, they're perennially one of my favorite bands but i mean i would say Th that that would be a, a prime example of a band that was sort of defied categorization, but still was you know kicking around in the late eighties or early nineties. I don't know. Maybe up. maybe it's just my perspective on it. I didn't like it because I I mean I don't know. I I, I thought they um I thought they just 
I, I didn't think it was anything new, but maybe maybe the fact that they mix two things together, or maybe I just didn't hear enough of it. Like maybe there's records or songs I didn't hear that were new. I and don't know. And there's no accounting for taste. I mean, who? Well, then if there's no accounting for taste and all this is real irrelevant anyway. <laughs> but I mean, there's got to be some kind of you know. I mean, you know, like a barometer for quality. Maybe I don't. I don't know. But but that's not. I mean, you know that. Uh, I'm again. Yeah, my perspective on this is obviously not the only one. So maybe that was something new and I missed it, or maybe. It was stuff that had been done before, but you were young and didn't hear. I don't know. <laughs> or maybe the stuff that I heard in the 80s that I thought was new was actually old hat also because I was too young to know <laughs> what was going on. What did you think was the most hot shit kicking around like the early 80s in those first few years? I mean, what, what was I into the what, most? What, the, what were you the most into at that time? Like, I, Well, different things, but the, the most hot shit in the early 80s, like, like, like from like 82 – to 80, you know, 81, 82, 83, 84, that kind of stuff. Uh, probably the two biggest things I found that, that excited me and made me go, wow, I've never heard anything like this were uh, Maiden was the, you know, the, 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 the Maiden albums that were coming out at that time because I thought they sounded very, um, I mean, I was 13, 14, you know, years old, but I, I thought there, I was, I was like the, the, the progressive sort of, you know, very technical aspects of them that I appreciated a lot and the musical aspects as well. It's sort of the power of that music mm-hmm. and then black flag actually, I yeah. mean, I'll have to say, cause I was really big uh, into black flag and the, the whole attitude and the music, the fact that there was like a hardcore band that, that had a whole uh, uh, lyrics and, and uh, attitude that were so introspective, mm-hmm. you know, and the music was like progressive. It was uh, some of those black flag songs. I'd never heard. I never thought anybody did anything like them before. I mean, there was like King Crimson, maybe they're trying to emulate up to a point those riffs and, and melody, you know, guitar melodies that were really strange. And I never uh, heard anything like it before. And I don't think I've heard anything like some of it since either. Uh, and at the same time to have this really anxiety ridden, uh, introspective sort of, intellectual in a non-pretentious way of uh, lyrics and, and singing to it you know so to me those are the two things that really i'd say i mean plenty of stuff excited me i mean i heard saint vitus the first time and i thought that was the weirdest thing i never heard anything like that ever <laughs> there's tons of stuff in the early 80s that was like original i think and there's all sorts of electronic and new wave and all that stuff like that that I wasn't that into, but some of which it was was quite striking as well. Yeah, I had a feeling you were gonna say Killing Joke, but then I, it didn't come out. But I, I never, no, I never got into Killing Joke. I heard a couple songs here and there, but I guess it didn't didn't resonate didn't, with you. Well, I don't know. I don't. Yeah, I don't remember the song. I remember having a couple of compilations, yeah. SST compilation, blasting concept albums that had Killing Joke, and I I don't remember specifically. I remember I knew that heard the songs, but I didn't. I guess it didn't have a big impact on me. I don't know. No, see, you know, whatever happens, happens. Oh, <laughs> well, well, since we were talking about like the mental evolution before and, we, and talking about the, the nature of the brain, the makeup of the brain, I'm glad we actually came to this because it was one of the things I wanted to ask. I'm psyched that it came here. Um, I wanted to talk about the, the essence of morality and certain things that we, um, you know, uh, imagine as just like intrinsically human um, some people would say like god-given or in, you know imbued that way but uh, i was just watching on the colbert report the other day and there was this neurophilosopher named patricia churchland and she was doing this work with voles and there were these two different species of vole um, who either had an abundance of or lacked a certain chemical in their brain that would mean that they either mated for life or like mated once and were just like done, and so she was thinking that there she that there's actually like everything could be distilled down if we if only we dug deep enough like like there's an, a chemical explanation for love a chemical explanation for oh. everything really how do you feel about that? Um, a chemical explanation. Well, yeah, where that where there's not like an extra no. qualitative character about no, I don't, I don't about, about what ever, it means to like you know. I don't emotions. think we're ever going to find a chemical explanation for everything. Yeah, because like science isn't enough. There is still an extra. Yeah, something I, there. yes, I believe science is not enough because uh, and a lot of, there's a lot of physical lists lately and all that who believe that, but I think it's fun, fundamentally uh, what it fundamentally comes down to is that um, science is just 
always going to be because of the way science operates because of the it is always going to be just one side of the picture because science is what's observed okay so uh, especially when it comes to talking about brain activity brain states or or uh, observation has to be done by somebody's brain right mm -hmm. yeah. I and mean, you observe with the 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 perceptual organs that are uh, got to be hooked up to your brain or your nervous system or it's not going to happen. Right? So, <laughs> so, uh, you, you're always going to be observing something, right? And so if you observe all the brain states, um, uh, you're just observing, if you're talking about the, uh, um, observing, you know, the brain states, well, you're all, you're, it's always going to be a matter of observing some kind of technical data, um, to, to understand what's going on, right? But there's always another side to it, which is the actual experience of it, right? Let's say, well, that someone could say, well, then obviously we're going to explain all the experiences you have through causal factors, you know, through what, what causes, causes that experience, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, and that's a, a certain brain state. But that's, that gets into a sketchy uh, area and it's a philosophical area and a lot of scientists get really dogmatic about that or people in general get very dogmatic about science and say no no it's the explanation because it's science and because we observe it therefore it is what's real about something you know but that doesn't there's a there's a fundamental bias about that which they're not acknowledging and that's when you observe something um then that is more real than what is not being observed Mm. Okay. Then, and now you can say, "Well, how do you know there's anything that's not being observed?" Well, because I'm experiencing something, experiencing something right now, you know. And you can you, you can come up with all sorts of things that you could observe about my brain that correlate to those experiences. Meaning, you can, for instance, uh, um, someone I've heard I've heard someone say in response to something I said, saying, "Well, happiness." I mean, that's just, happiness is just dopamine. That's what it is. And this is exactly the kind of thing you're talking about, right? It, it, this sounds like that same argument, yes. Yeah, yeah, okay, absolutely. so happiness, and, and someone said to me, oh, well, that's just dopamine. I was like, well, what do you mean it's just dopamine? Well, happiness is just, it's just dopamine. That's what it is. Like, you you, you experience happiness, and, and every time someone experiences happiness, every time they, uh, a doctor or a scientist can, can uh, um, investigate by looking at, at uh, the chemical, uh, you know, take a brain scan or whatever, the, the, the chemical uh, uh, processes that are taking place in your brain and you're producing all sorts of dopamine in these areas that are causing you happiness. So, so you're saying that happiness is constituted by dopamine and that's all there is to it. It exhausts the entire thing. Well, wait a second. How, why is it then that when someone becomes happy, that their dopamine levels rise. Uh, how you're assuming that you're assuming that the causal uh, nexus there is. I mean that 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 somebody uh, dopamine surges in your in a certain part of your brain and then you become happy. Why would it be then that some event would happen outside of your body and you get excited about that and it makes you happy and then you notice the dopamine levels rise can you say that it's necessarily the dopamine or the chemicals that are causing the happiness or or is it something that is happy you know, you, you, something that makes you happy causes the dopamine to rise mm -hmm. an exciting event cause you know so in this sense you can say scientifically and you can observe whatever you want but it's a matter of semantics or it's a matter of it's a matter of um it's sort of a chicken and the egg thing you see what i'm saying yeah uh, therefore I don't think we're ever going to prove that that uh, we are our mental states are just a series of chemical processes because you're never going to be able to to account for the fact that you, what you're observing is one thing, but you're never going to be able to observe your observing self in the act of observing, are you? I'm glad you brought that up actually cause because because it, it's it, not going to happen. It's it's not it's not possible because yeah, the, sub, the subject is always going to be separate from the object when you are actually talking about something you learn through observation. There, there's actually a, an article that I feel like I've brought up in a number of interviews, but I'll mention it to you. Maybe you've heard of it. If not, go read it. It's called, uh, how, uh, wait, um, what is it like to be a bat? Oh, by, I've read that. Yeah, yeah, by Tom that. That's, that's exactly Nagel. that. Nagel. It's like that yeah. there's, that there's actually a, a qualitative nature 
to being the experiencer of something that it, it means something to actually experience something and that's and, yeah and, and that's got to be the missing spark right and it's going to be the it's going to continue to be the missing spark because i don't see i think it's a fundamental uh, uh, uh you know it's a fundamental i don't want to say a fundamental truth but that's just the way I, the way that uh, experience uh, it seems impenetrable in that sense that your experience is going to be something that's not quantifiable and not observable because you're always one step behind it. When you when you try to observe the observer, uh, you end up in a feedback loop, or you end up in a in a catch twenty two, where it's like, well, you can observe uh, the self that observed a minute ago, but then who's doing the observing of that? You know, mm-hmm. um, you're never going to be able to uh, observe uh, the observer, right? Um, even if you take someone who's you know uh, someone other than yourself, you will observe while they're observing. But you, the, the the experience of being a, of being conscious. Is something that is, is cannot be considered the same exact phenomena of of what you call uh, what you consider to be causing the consciousness, which is a bunch of chemical uh, chemicals. And people tend to privilege uh, chemical processes, and particularly they tend to privilege things uh, that, like ontologically, if, you know, in a, in a in the sense of, in the sense of what is real mm-hmm. about something or what is more essential about something, they tend to privilege the it, microscopic they it, say it, it's kind of reductivist really, too because they're saying it's only it's, about it's, that it's complete reductivist what is saying oh well what is what is what what is a brain really or what is a state of happiness really well it's a bunch of these really small you know atomic things or it's a bunch of dopamine or serotonin why oh because when you look through a microscope that's what you really see so it's smaller so when you look at a smaller level you see this stuff therefore that those constituents are actually the real thing why would it be that 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 uh, you know, well, you, I'm looking at my hand, but that's not. It doesn't really. That's just. That's just sort of an illusion. What's what it really is is a bunch of atoms floating around. There's space between them. So really, uh, well, why is it more real when you look at it at a smaller level when you magnify it? I mean, why is that any more real than looking at my hand right now? It's the same thing with the brain states, saying that what's really going on is these chemical, these minute, really complex chemical processes. That's the real deal. Your experiences are just as a result of that, but they can all be explained. Well, no, your experiences are just as re- your observation of your experiences are just as real as your observation of the chemical compounds that you correlate with them. So there's your long answer. <laughs> that was an awesome long answer. Uh, 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 yeah, <laughs> and uh, and I'm psyched that you've read that article too. It was actually one of my one of my yeah. faves. It was really it was like a five to seven page article, but it really it, I've never brought up an article more in just everyday conversation than that one. I think it's just yeah, yeah, well, that's a, it's really a profound. Yeah, yeah. All right, so um, we're wow, we're getting on now. We've been on almost forty five minutes. All right, um, we should talk a little bit about the album at, at least. Uh, yeah, probably as, as yeah. awesome as this is, <laughs> we have to. Yeah. I've probably been avoiding it, but go ahead. Yeah. Oh well, <laughs> tell me about Bertrand Russell's sex. Then I don't have oh, lyrics. No, I can hear most nothing, of them. But there's, I, I, I have to say, I have a stock response to that. And I'm oh, you have a stock response. I want. Let's hear it. I don't care. No, well, there's not much to say about it besides a stock response because it's just a bunch of metaphors strung together like most of my songs so really it's i think you'll like this stock response though it's it's, it's the best stock response uh, right. that i've ever come with it's basically well I, you know bertrand russell i, I don't I'm not you know i i sort of like some of the things he has to say he's actually one of those guys and this is not the stuff part of the stock response he's one of those guys who i do think is a total scientific dogmatist mm-hmm. um yeah, it was a to- i mean he's obviously this incredibly brilliant mathematician right but as a philosopher he's good too but I don't think he had the kind of mind that he had a very sort of meticulous, concise, uh, uh, detail-oriented, uh, mathematical sort of left brain thing going on. And he was also very intelligent in philosophy, but his philosophy seemed to, I think it was sort of limited. He sort of limited things that he inquired about quite a bit. Um, and uh, 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 so I mean I'm not he's not my favorite philosopher although I like him and I've read his stuff but mm-hmm. but he uh, he apparently had these really these ideas about sex and and uh, um, I don't even know exactly what they were he was very liberal and sort of uh, um, sexually liberated for his time which is hard to imagine when you look at it like a picture of him or hear him talk or something like that uh, and so that was just really a bunch of talk about Bertrand Russell's sex den like what you know like where he would take his graduate students to have a have an orgy or something i don't know <laughs> sort of a silly conversation about that we really with a friend of mine who said they ended up coming up 
Bertrand Russell's Sex Den, or is it just out of nowhere, you know? But the the song itself and the lyrics are just a, a metal. This is the stock part, or a heavy metal version of "Don't Stand So Close to Me" by the Police. That's right. right. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> I'm a teacher. You know that, right? Or no? Um, I. That was something else I was going to get to, and it's um, I think it's awesome that you happen to bring that up because my wife is a teacher, and her yeah. favorite um, book is Lolita. She loves Nabokov. Oh, and, and that's, oh God. Well, yeah, that Lolita, yeah. <laughs> that's essentially go. that, you know, so there you go. <laughs> Beautiful. I'm not talking about it. I, I, I mean this, too, not not just to be defensive, not to be, uh, not because I'm trying to, you know, whatever. I, I don't I don't have these experiences. I just have fantasies, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, you know, a, a, a fantasy is just enough, you know? That's <laughs> so, what Billy Joel said. Yeah, You probably don't know that song, though. Anyway, <laughs> you do. I, I, I barely know Billy Joel. I, have, I actually have a hard time with Billy Joel. I'm, not gonna song, I'm sure you do. There's a song called just, It's Just a Fantasy. Is only Sometimes a fantasy is all you need. That, 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 you sound like you just sang it to me. But Oh, my anyway. God. <laughs> I'm so sorry that I inadvertently channeled Billy Joel. I, <laughs> uh, you can do that I, a lot. It happens a lot to people because he has all these sort of common sense kind of things that he says a lot and uh, in his lyrics. And people who, who don't even like him will, will say something that sounds just like one of his songs. So, you know. <laughs> I think liking Billy Joel is, is a, is a pure matter of it's a it's a big matter of where you came from and when you grew up because i mm. i could totally see how well i actually like him a lot because i grew up you know in the 70s and that you know uh like three hours away from new york city and, yeah. and, and just something about that whole attitude and atmosphere and something no of course he's done some really bad bad stuff too uh but i like some of it but i could see i mean i think i personally would hate billy joel if i was from somewhere else in some other time i think i wouldn't get him at all i'd be like what the fuck if you very... recommend something by billy joel to uh, to someone well who's new... i don't think you if you don't post 1980 i don't like anything he did so if there's anything 70s billy joel give it a shot maybe or or 1980 81 maybe that's all about right. it yeah uh, yeah, if you haven't heard the '70s stuff, well, I'm sure you heard the hits. Also. I mean, only the hits. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, the, the hits are the, the a lot of hits. So, but if you, well, I'm sure you know about the stuff that he did before he was Billy Joel, right? Some of that stuff's pretty incredible. I mean, Maybe not quite so much. Yeah, really, we, really? Oh well, man, just tell me real quick. Well, yeah. okay. Well, the, the Attila record. Do you know about that? Or? I do not. Oh my God, you don't? I oh, do dude. Not. Okay, Billy Joel did a record in 1970 where he played just the uh, organ. Uh, just the B three and it, and is a drummer. That's it. And it's okay. so it sounds like Deep Purple. It's it's like metal. It's like it's very it's totally heavy hard rock. Wow. And it's we oh yeah it's very cult sounding. Yeah. And <laughs> if you go on the internet, you'll find it immediately on YouTube. Attila, Billy Attila. Joel's Attila. Oh, it's a if you haven't heard that yet, it'll blow your mind. I'm gonna check it out. And he also did uh, after that or no before that. There's two albums called uh, by his band before that called The Hassles. All the right. Hassles. And there's that's straight psychedelic straight psychedelic uh, rock and it's it's actually pretty good nice i'll check so, it yeah out before he was billy me. joel he did all sorts of crazy stuff thanks Actually. mike appreciate that uh, yeah, yeah no problem oh man i've got a picture popped up right here and wow he's got so much more yeah. hair than well there's one. that picture that's interesting on attila because they're sitting in the they're sitting in like a meat locker or something there's a bunch of slabs of like red like oh, yeah, yeah. sides of beef behind them it's really weird he's a weird guy yeah. Yeah, it's, it's pretty weird it is really weird. <laughs> it's pretty. It's kind of metal, actually. It is. It, well, the album's kind of metal. I mean, in a deep purplish kind of sense, you know. Yeah, in, in a proto metal kind of way. I am yeah, fully exactly. down with that. All right. Yeah, yeah. I'll be checking you out later. And uh, my thanks again. And if I can ask you one last favor before I hang it up with you, yeah, yeah. can you just say your name and that you're listening to the Last Rights podcast? Okay. Right now. Go for it. This is Mike Scalzi. Uh, I'm. You're listening to The Last Rites Podcast. I like it. <laughs> this is very Dio. I try to, you know, do the, the Dio voice, the Jimmy Stewart voice, you know. This is our uh, Last Rites Podcast, and you're with uh, Ronnie James uh, Dio. He has that sort of very deliberate, professorial accent. Anyway. I love me some yeah. Ronnie James Dio, and that was a, a pretty sweet impression too <laughs> that's how he, he he has a weird voice <laughs> yeah especially but, for an italian guy you know yeah kind of a weird talking voice and then like the most magical singing voice that's right that's the great thing about you and that cat was from my home state like i live in mass i spent time in, in vermont but i was born and, and raised the first 20 years of my life in manchester and he was born yeah. in like portsmouth new hampshire i think so his, his, his family was from my home province the oh, yeah? 
It's from Cal- Calabria. Is it Calabria? Yeah. That's super cool. The only conversation I ever had with Dio, which was awesome, was about Italian ancestry. We figured out we're from the same place. It was pretty cool. That's really cool. What, what it was, was awesome. <laughs> a friend of mine was opening for for Dio on a like a short tour of I don't know where, just California or something, and it, and she said, uh, you know, before the show. If you want to meet Ronnie James Dio when he's relaxed and just sitting around, you know, sitting around with the rest of us, not not with some line of kids or whatever, you know, you can come before the show. And so, yeah, hell yeah, so we did, and we got down into the uh, uh, right where he was, where he was uh, just sitting around before going on, and uh, just in this little room with like you know five of us or something like that. And Dio was there, and he and he started just cracking jokes and saying silly stuff, just like a normal conversation. It was pretty awesome. So we got about fifteen minutes, twenty minutes in his presence to talk with him about whatever. <laughs> and I started mentioning the old country, and he got in, into talking about that. You know, that's really cool. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> that's uh, everyone. Everyone's got a Dio story. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. God, <laughs> for better or for worse, not and, and that one right there is one of the better ones. I like that. Funny. all right mike well i'm gonna let anyway, you go well, um th- all right well thanks again for talking talk to me later. here yeah no problem and um yeah this has been metal, metal matt longo for the last rights podcast talking to mike scalzi from slough Fig. and thanks again mike the new one's digital resistance go pick it or any one of the other nine slough Fig albums up before when they were the lord weird slough Fig. now oh, digitally physically cd record just just go buy it and go see him live if you can all right all right mike take care of yourself man see you later, later take it easy. all right bye